we're using Zoom and speakers who are, are, are speaking will be unmuted when it's their chance to speak. The audience is auto automatically coming in on mute and there will be a chance to raise your hand via the Zoom chat box. And when we get to our question and answer period, you can unmute yourself to ask a question. If you are having technical difficulties during this presentation, we have a back office who is available to help you. Let's see. Um, if you need help, you can email the coordinator at namra at gmail.com, call or text the number here, or talk to us via our Facebook Messenger. So again, if, that's, if you're having trouble with any of the technology right now, that's how you get help. So this event is intended to talk about the money behind Canadian mega dams and the transmission corridors that serve as extension cords to export this power to US cities. We want to expose the corporations, the politicians and the process that has been perpetuating unsustainable Canadian hydropower development, a form of extreme energy extraction that's as dirty as fossil fuels. This has been going on for over 100 years to the detriment of people and the environment to the north. We're grateful to have you all here able to participate and we want to take a moment to acknowledge the current pandemic in our communities particularly the hydro impacted communities in remote regions of the north, many of them eight hours or more from the hospital. In addition to the historic impacts of hydro development on these communities, which includes food security and disruption to the community fabric, the pandemic is exacerbating new, this, these challenges and we want to ignore that, acknowledge that. Um, our allies at Waniskaton, which is an alliance of hydro impacted communities based in, Ma in Winnipeg, has um, a program going on to assist the Indigenous communities as a program of Indigenous led co community countermeasures to COVID 19. And if you wish to support these efforts or any other at this time, you can reach out here. So we want to acknowledge that and thank you everyone for being here. Uh, today is the second day of 72 hours of Earth Day action that is taking place across the United States for the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And on Earth Day 50 years ago, about 10% of the US population joined together to protest and take action for cleaner water, cleaner air, and a healthier planet. NAMRA has been participating in this 72-hour virtual event. Yesterday, we did a live stream with the Sunrise Movement, a youth-led climate organization, on the impacts of hydro development on the environment and frontline communities. We celebrated the 30th anniversary of the voyage of the Odiac, which came to New York City 30 years ago on Earth Day. It was a campaign by the Cree and Inuit of Northern Quebec to stop a $17 billion contract between New York State and Hydro-Quebec, which would have resulted in damming the Great Whale River. That campaign was a success. The contract was canceled. We have released a film on this. Um, and we were also very privileged yesterday to have Matthew Mukosh, a EU wisdom keeper from Wapmagustii First Nation who was on that original voyage in 1990. And so the battle continues. And we hope you'll take a minute to look at our film, which is on our YouTube channel. It was done for us um, by Standing Bear Indigenous Network, and it tells about the 30th anniversary of the voyage of the Odiac. So day two of 
this 72 hour three day virtual Earth Day protest is about stopping the money pipelines for oops, seeing, stopping the money pipeline. So climate leader Bill McKibben and others are calling for divestment from fossil fuels today. They're calling on banks and financial institutions to stop putting their money into dirty energy, oil, gas, tar sands, and so forth. Our event today, NAMRA's event, aims to make hydro financing and the money pipeline for hydro part of that larger conversation about divesting from dirty energy. Canadian hydro is an extreme energy extraction on par with the tar sands, mining, and oil fields. It's a 100-year-old technology for generating electricity that hasn't changed and has proven time again, time and again, to be financially unsound. More dams are planned for export, and we in the U.S. have a responsibility to work with our allies in Canada, Canada to prevent more dams and more destruction to our rivers and communities. It's this export demand that is driving the new dams. In March of 2020, NAMRA issued a report done by Northbridge Energy Partners. Peter Kelly Detweiler is one of our speakers today, and it tied those exports to the U.S. to the new dams. We know today we can only scratch the surface in the two hours that we have, and we have time allotted at the end for a Q&A, and we hope that we will continue to stay connected. My presentation will focus on all these dams across Canada, um, the hydro development that's been going on for 100 years, um, obviously is very destructive, but we want to um, focus also on the new dams that are being proposed and some of the new transmission corridors. So this is our focus today. We'll be um, going across the continent from the east in Labrador where Roberta Benefield, the Grand River Keeper, will be talking about the Muskrat Falls financial boondoggle and the new Gull Island Dam. We'll be talking about the hydro corridors that will get that new hydro as well as the old hydro down to the cities in uh, New York and Boston. Then we'll go, be going across to the center of the, cor the continent to um, Cross Lake and Pimichikamak territory, where we'll hear from Rita and Tommy Manias about the efforts to stop some of the hydro dams in Canada. There is a new kiosk dam in, in northern Manitoba, Manitoba, north of their community, as well as a new transmission corridor, the Bipole 3, that goes down to Minneapolis. And that has been completed, um, but it's still very controversial. Then we'll mo be moving over to the West Coast, where we'll be hearing from Owen Finn about the Site C Dam. So I just want to focus very briefly on the costs of these dams, just to give some idea of the scale. So we have Nalcor Energy over in Labrador, Muskrat Falls, $12.7 billion. We have Manitoba Hydro and Kiask at $8.7 billion. We have BC Hydro at $9.6 billion. And that's just the cost to build those. Then we have the four transmission corridors that we want to focus on. Um, these are proposed corridors, the New England Clean Energy Connect, New England Clean Power Link, which will go through Vermont to Boston, the Champlain Hudson Power Express to New York City, and Bipole 3 and the Great Northern out in Manitoba. So when I did the math, I came up with a total of $40 billion invested in these destructive mega dam technologies and their corridors. Um, I just wanted to drill down a little bit into one of these, which is the New England Clean Energy Connect here in, Mass in uh, Maine, in New England, where I am. This is extremely controversial. Uh, it is opposed by most of the people in the community and in the state. It will travel 
It's an extension cord from the Quebec border down to Boston, and that's $950 million for the corridor itself. Um, to give you an example of the money behind this, the New England Clean Energy Connect is owned by Central Maine Power, a quaint sounding Maine name, which is actually a wholly owned subsidiary of a van grid, which is itself 81% owned by Iberdrola, a Spanish multinational corporation. So this is far from local renewable energy. This is a multinational corporation willing to spend $950 million for a 145-mile transmission line to supply so-called clean energy to Boston. They're so desperate for this deal to go ahead that in the last six months, they spent $7 million on PR, greenwashing campaigns, ads on TV, print mailings. I think most of the people on the phone on this call probably know about the types of greenwashing that these corporations will go to to convince us that their hydro is green. So when it comes to the exports and why Hydro-Quebec is so desperate to export this power, um, Hydro-Quebec is the one that will be supplying these New England quarters with power for Boston and New York, 16% of its sales volume and about 22% of its net income is from exports to the U.S. Without these exports, Hydro-Quebec's profits are in trouble. It's a known fact and publicly stated. The premier of Hydro-Quebec wants to make Quebec the battery of North America. So there are more dams planned and the bottom line is they need it for their profits. And what is really concerning to us as an alliance is that this really does undermine the development of local energy options. It creates a disincentive. The more cheap, so-called cheap Canadian hydro we have in the US, the less demand there is for local US energy sources. So consumers aren't motivated to do the types of conservation and efficiency measures that would reduce our de demand for electricity, kind of have this why bother we can get some Canadian hydro attitude. And a word about imports of Canadian hydro to the US. It is raising some red flags here um, south of the border in January of 2020 the U.S. House of Representatives, um, let's see, uh, international, asked the International Trade Commission to begin an investigation into the renewable electricity imports and the effects of increased commitments in the state of Massachusetts in particular. But they do want to look at the impact of hydro and imports from Canada on efforts to meet renewable energy targets here in the US and as well on the impacts on commercial and residential rates. So there is some controversy around these imports and we will be participating in that proceeding. And before we move on to our first speaker, I just want to say a word about the unique nature of the financing for Canadian Hydro. These are, as Roberta and others will explain, crown corporations. That means they are state-owned monopolies who have the exclusive right to exploit Canada, Canada's rivers and to develop these resources and to do uh, the sales and distribution and whatnot through the regulatory system in Canada, of course. But these are slightly different financing models than you might read about with other large dams across the world where the World Bank is doing a lot of the financing and the clean development mechanisms which are special financing mechanisms to promote clean and sustainable energy. Those really aren't applicable to the financing models here. What is somewhat applicable are the renewable portfolio standard incentives that we have here in the US, but so far, Canadian hydropower for the most part has not been able to qualify for these uh, state level incentives in the US. And that's really something we need to keep an eye out on. And it's really a concern in connection with the Green New Deal climate plans. 
So I will um, sum up by saying again, thank you and hope that this is informative and that you enjoy learning from us. We will switch over to Peter Kelly Detweiler from Northbridge Energy Partners. I will stop sharing my screen so that Peter um, can share his screen. Good afternoon. I'm gonna jump into my screen right now. Let's see, can you all see that? We can see you. Okay, can you see that screen yet? Hang on one second. I do. All right, okay. one moment. Let me just go to share screen again. Okay, share screen. Oh, here we go. Um, how about that? There you go. Okay, now we're going into slideshow. Okay, so really quickly, because um, we got 15 minutes or so. Um, interestingly enough, we're looking at alternatives to Hydro-Quebec imports just as I was 30 years ago when the Odiac made its way down the Hudson, which just shows you that, yeah, my hair is grayer and everybody's hair is a lot longer in the last six weeks, um, but something's never <laughs> seemed to change. Uh, I thought after we won all of our cases, I worked for the Cree, for the Cree Indians in as an energy consultant in Quebec, in Ontario, and in Manitoba. And so we were fighting Peace River, we were fighting um, a bunch of stuff in, uh, in, in Ontario and in Quebec, and we won all the cases. Um, this was 1990 to 95, roughly, roughly. And I thought these would then go away. Well, that was kind of stupid, I guess, because the, the head pops up again, the Hydra head. Anyway, um, what I'm gonna talk to you about are some of the the options to Hydro-Quebec imports and, and more broadly options across all of North America and the world. I spend most of my time um, writing for Forbes and doing strategic energy consulting work, uh, sometimes for the likes of large renewables development companies and also uh, for money. So for example, later today, I'm doing a webcast for investors on the impacts of COVID. So I read three to four hours a day and track all these trends. So let's jump into some of the things that are happening that represent meaningful alternatives to Hydro-Quebec imports. First, we can see solar, which was a relatively small industry, almost non-existent 10 years ago, has really jumped in to be quite significant. Um, and in fact, there was a report out two days ago from the Energy Information Administration, which is DOE, that two thirds of, of the new installed capacity, that is new power plants built in 2019, were wind and solar in the United States, and one third was gas fire generation. That's never happened before in the history of any power grid, let alone the US. And this is an eye chart. All this is meant to show you is one simple thing. Every single line on here, whether it's orange, green, blue, or purple, is a solar technology. And the vertical axis is efficiencies, how efficient those panels are at converting sunlight into electricity. And you can see every single one of these is up and to the right because we keep getting better with our technology. At the same time, the technology gets better, whether it's wind turbines, batteries, or solar panels, the costs are coming down, in large part because of the massive supply chain efficiencies in China. We import a lot of these materials out of China, and they have become very, very efficient at driving costs down all across the spectrum. This is a global international market, make no mistake. Domestic solar is still a Chinese or a Malaysian or a Vietnamese product, and very rarely are the panels themselves manufactured in the United States. But the good news is they're falling in cost roughly 15% per year and have been for the last decade. So they, they just get really, really cost effective and therefore represent an increasingly meaningful alternative to Hydro-Quebec imports. Here's a view in New England. I was out at the control room uh, early March before they shut everything down and stopped visitors from coming in for COVID. This curve is a simple curve underneath the gray line at the bottom. That gray line at the bottom represents generation, conventional generation that you have to fire up or Hydro-Quebec imports. And the dotted line curve is what the old demand would have looked like pre-solar. So now we see a situation where you add in all the solar and the demand curve is a lot lower than it was before. But what is most striking about this chart is this is the first time, April 21st, 2018, in the history of the New England power grid, that demand at 3.30 in the morning was lower than net demand at 3.30 in the afternoon. 
That has never happened before in the history of the grid. The operators told me they were waiting. They knew it was eventually going to come, and then it showed up. This yellow slice or orange slice is only going to increase in time as the solar resource gets larger and larger here in New England, and specifically in Massachusetts, where the majority of it is. But again, you can see it starts to become a meaningful part of the energy conversation. Um, and then there's offshore wind. I just did a webcast yesterday for other investors um, discussing for an hour what's going on in offshore wind. So right now we have a 30 megawatt facility built off of Block Island right now with five, six megawatt turbines. And that's nothing, that, that by the way had cost $244 a megawatt hour. The latest bids have been around, well, the last one was $58 a megawatt hour, so a quarter of the price just a few years later. And the day before yesterday, they just loaded on two massive towers and two turbines for a project off of Virginia, this 12 megawatt one you can see at the bottom of the screen, coastal Virginia offshore. Now, in the next few years, starting in 2023, we'll start to see this build out all the way along the East Coast. In fact, the entire build out along the East Coast will represent more capacity than is flowed through New England. All those power plants built offshore will be, will be larger in aggregate than the entire New England market from an installed capacity basis. And they produce energy about roughly 60 to 60% 60 of the time. Sometimes the wind doesn't blow or it doesn't blow to give them 100% output. So very shortly, we're gonna see Vineyard Wind, 800 megawatts, coming online, that's 2023, because the feds delay the environmental permitting by about a year. And then shortly after that, we're gonna see Mayflower Wind coming online, and then a whole host of others. So we're looking at in Massachusetts alone, 3,200 megawatts of offshore wind. And then Connecticut has, I believe it's another 800 megawatts. Rhode Island has its own commitments, and Maine is looking at floating offshore wind. So within the next five to 10 years, this resource will be a rather considerable portion, and I've got some slides from ISO New England in a minute, showing just how large this will be. And then of course, battery storage comes into play as well because the wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time, but battery storage can help to pick up that slack and provide at least four hours of energy that's charged by the wind and the sun and then discharged later on the day when we need it. Here are the state targets, by the way. You can just see in the beginning 2016, Massachusetts had this relatively meaningful 1600 megawatt commitment. Then they added another 1600 megs. Then New York put in 9,000 megawatts of commitments. Virginia just announced 5,200 megawatts and so on and so forth. And this is just like the first round when they get floating offshore wind that doesn't have to have poles fixed to the ground. We'll see even larger amounts of this stuff being built on both coasts. So this industry is just getting started right now and has a lot of people very excited. Same thing um, in the generation space, gas fire generation is getting more flexible and it has to be to ramp up and down in response to the intermittency of renewables. So it can become much more flexible. I visited the folks at GE and Schedecti for seven hours just again before COVID shut everything down because I'm working on a 350 page book on this whole thing. And they explained how fast you can now ramp up and ramp down these turbines as you apply artificial intelligence and better understand what's happening in the machines and the stresses you can put them on or put them under, which we didn't know before. So we can make them much more responsive, which helps in the whole mix. And then energy storage, you can see from this slide, just this is batteries, for the most part, lithium ion batteries, like we see in electric vehicles. And you can see right now in 2020, estimated 1,400 megawatts of storage, and then this thing just explodes. In fact, this morning, I read NextEra, which is the largest renewable developer's quarterly earnings. They said next year, they're going to install enough batteries in the United States that it would be able to supply four hours of electricity to the entire state of Rhode Island. So one company into the United States has enough batteries next year to supply Rhode Island for four hours of its demand on any given day. That's how fast this industry is expanding as well, which will be needed to accommodate that variable wind and solar. And here you can see the costs just coming down really quickly with batteries. I know I'm blowing through this. You're basically asking me to explain what I do in a 12 hour workshop, which I'll be doing Monday and Tuesday online in 15 minutes. So the, walk, the takeaway from this is quite simple. 
By the way, this is a battery in someone's house. That thing that looks like a fridge is a battery. And here's what this looks like in New England. We can see December, how much solar, December of 2019 versus what we expect to see 10 years from now. That number is going to be higher than that for sure. And then lastly, um, here was the old mix in 2019, natural gas nukes. What's going to change all that? A lot more wind, probably not more natural gas, more nuclears get retired. So we'll see there's definitely a need for new energy resources as we retire a lot of the traditional resources. Offshore wind and solar can do that. Gas can do a lot of it. And certainly you could have your existing imports in the worst case scenario, but you don't need to build new facilities to pull this in from Hydro-Quebec. There are a lot of other resources out there that can make that happen. So in summary, what's going on in the whole space is rapid technological development. The, the solar panels, the batteries, electric vehicles, wind turbines are getting more and more efficient every single year because this is a global multi-trillion dollar transformation of power markets. Um, so the tech's getting better, the costs are falling because of volumes in the markets and supply chain efficiencies. We're seeing retirement of a lot of existing assets that are end of their lifespan. And folks are realizing that the cost effectiveness of these resources is such that as Nextera pointed out on their quarterly call, wind and four hours of battery or solar and four hours of battery, new resources are cheaper than the operating costs of existing coal and nuclear plants. And I'll say that again, cheaper than the operating costs. That's not building a new one, that is simply taking the existing one and running it. That's how cheap these resources are getting because of this global transformation. So there are certainly options to AHQ. They're not all simple because each one of these is a piece of a puzzle that has to be fitted together with the other ones and thought about how do you integrate them? What kind of energy efficiency do you need? What kind of other responsive assets? But the, the good news is the technology is out there and we can solve this problem without resorting to that building block of um, damaging uh, imports from Hydro-Quebec that will in fact lock us in for rather expensive power for the next 30 years. So with that, I open to questions. Anybody have a question? Um, Michael Moore just put out um, quite an amazing piece that um, talks about how much uh, um, dirty energy is involved in the clean energy sector. Yeah. Um, do you want to comment on that production and the impact it might have and the validity of the statements in it? Yeah, I haven't read the piece, but I track this. Uh, I, I, you know, I read three or four hours a day, so I track this pretty closely. Let's start with batteries. Okay, so batteries, the typical chemistry today is nickel, manganese, cobalt. Ratio of one nickel, one manganese, one cobalt. 60 to 65% of the cobalt in the world comes from the Katanga province, which is in the undemocratic Republic of Congo. And some of that involves child labor. Um, and so now what they're trying to do is use blockchain to track non-child labor cobalt, that is clean cobalt. But at the same time, they're changing the chemistry to an eight to one to one ratio. So nickel eight, one manganese, one cobalt. So that's one issue. The next issue is the energy involved in making the batteries and solar uh, modules, the panels themselves. Since 50% or more of both of those still come out of China, and China is a relatively coal intensive economy, it takes you a couple of years, for example, well, let's say maybe a year of driving your electric vehicle as um, relative to burning gasoline to before you get carbon even because of the carbon intensity of putting that battery in your car that was manufactured in a coal intensive Chinese power grid. Right, so none of these things, uh, and in solar modules, there are things like uh, uh, there are different uh, metals in that that are also toxic. So we really have to think about life cycle costs. We have to think about recycling. We have to think about circular economy. Um, you can't just look at any one of these, as we know from from the Quebec issue. You have to look at these things in their totality and fully understand the benefits and the externalities both the positive and the negative ones to arrive at informed decisions. So Moore is right about that. 
But if the response is to say, oh, we're not going to do it, then he's wrong. If the response is to say, yes, we recognize that, and we need to focus a lot more energy on cleaning up the entire supply chain, starting with the power grid in China, and then moving all the way across, it does us no good if we toss our dirty garbage over the fence to somebody else. That doesn't help the planet because carbon's everywhere, right? So we really have to think about this thing holistically. I'm glad you raised the, the, the question because it is something that a lot of folks are, are focusing intently on right now. Thank you. Thank you for that great answer that was on my mind as well. I don't know if people have um, gotten the link to Michael Moore's new movie that he did with Jeff Gibbs. It's Planet Human, I believe is the title. It's free on YouTube. Hello? Thanks for addressing that, Peter. Um, I would have a question and maybe you talked about this and it went right past me, but when we look at say, you know, the 20 year life of a hydro contract, and we look at what the demand for energy might be in say Massachusetts, where NECAC is going to be delivering the 1200 megawatts from Canada. How could that be, that demand be flattened or reduced by conservation and efficiency, say over that 20 year period? Yeah, so um, I think first we have to acknowledge that Massachusetts and New England in general are leaders in energy efficiency and have been. But that having been said, I wrote a piece and interviewed folks from uh, Walmart and GE like five years ago. And they said, the thing about energy efficiency is that the low hanging fruit grows back. And so for example, they gave me the, the example when you walk into a Walmart and there's the freezer case, you know, with the vegetables in it in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Well, they've gone through six iterations of more efficient freezer cases and they're actually ripping out the first generation freezer cases and replacing them with gen six because they're that much better. So there's always new technology. Now, I don't mean to say that we should always worship at the foot of technology and fetishize it, but we've kind of created the situation where mm, smart tech is one of the ways out of this problem. And so there's still a lot more we could do. I mean, you look around New England, there's still a lot of inefficient um, practices that we engage in, whether inefficient lighting, poor insulation, and so on and so forth. What we have found over the years is that a dollar invested in energy efficiency is one of the most productive dollars you can invest in the economy because it's local and the savings essentially then get respent in the local economy as well. And you can also ramp it up and ramp it down. So let's say right after COVID, when we are comfortable again and don't have to wear masks like Heidi is, <laughs> um, we get back into a world where we actually can get into the spaces. One of the places we could rapidly ramp up our economic development strategies would be in the areas of efficiency and, and renewables. Um, the solar piece of it, interesting thing, from ISO New England's perspective, we are already seeing declining demand in Massachusetts and in New England in general. And the reason why is because they, they, if they looked at the before efficiency, they would say our growth is about 0.6% year over year over year. Once you add in efficiency and batteries and solar, they actually see that the net need for new generation is declining year after year after year. And that curve actually, the jaws widen over time. Um, there's more that can be done because we haven't tapped all the cost effective efficiency. I was on the phone this morning with one of the largest manufacturers in this country, and he said they still make efficiency investments on a three year payback. So get that. They need to get a 30% plus rate of return. I would take my house and mortgage the whole thing if I could get a 30% rate of return on my house and all my other assets. I would defer my kids schooling to get 30% rate of return. And yet, many corporations won't make an investment if the payback period is longer than three years. So there's still a huge amount of energy inefficiency in our local economy that could be cost effectively mined, if you will, that could displace the need for hydro imports. Peter, I, I, also, I, I just have one other question that kind of ties into what you were just talking about. I'm trying to figure out why these large mega dams and mega projects are still being funded when economists know that this, this, this need for new generation is going to decrease in the, in the future and they're probably going to lose money. So I'm, I'm just wondering who's behind these. To, they know they're going to lose money, but they're pushing them forward anyway. 
You know, it's it when I worked 30 years ago on this stuff, and I still hold the same view today, it's kind of like our military industrial complex, uh, which Eisenhower warned against some, you know, 50, 70 years ago now. Um, once you get this juggernaut built of self-interest, of self-perpetuation, inertia around these companies that exist to build dams, that hold a lot of political power in states or provinces, um, it's very hard to break that mold and turn that battleship to, to shift metaphors completely to something else. So part of it is there's simply this political inertia. It's what they know how to do. It is how their patronage structures have been built and it is how their economies function and have for a long, long time. And so, you know, eventually they'll run up against the realization that it, that it isn't cost effective. And at some point, if you're, let's say, um, you know, Romaine, there are all kinds of estimates, but they look like they're in the six or seven or even eight cents per kilowatt hour range, and the exports wouldn't seem to support that. So that one seems like, you know, Romaine C, for example, it looks like it's losing proposition from the beginning, but we're also looking at the same thing with the Vaudel plant, the nuclear plant in Georgia, where they're now way over budget, way past their original deadline for completion, and still the momentum of that project which balloons from an initial price tag of say $4 billion to now 16, 17, 18, 19 billion dollars. And now there's so much vested interest, nobody wants to pull the plug. So as much as anything, I think it's one of these things where it doesn't have to do with economics, it has to do with politics and embedded social inertia. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Peter. That was really fantastic and amazing. And we can take more questions at the end, but now we're really trying to be respectful of people's time. And I know that Roberta up in Labrador is waiting. And again, just want to thank you very much. And we really appreciate your participation. My pleasure. I've got to do some other things, but I'll try and check in in the end in case there are any, in case there are questions. And, and Meg, I would invite you as well. If there are other questions and I'm not there, shoot me an email and I'm happy to try and respond. That would be great. Thank you so much, Peter. My pleasure. So we're switching over um, to Roberta, um, and I will share my screen now. Julian will help me out with this. <laughs> and I'm... There you go. Okay, this is our next speaker, Roberta Benefiel. She's the Grand River Keeper from Labrador. She's worked tirelessly for decades to try to protect the Grand River or the Churchill River in Labrador from water extraction by NALCOR, which is the twin to Hydro-Quebec and Manitoba Hydro, I guess the triplet. Um, she has testified at numerous hearings, including the Muskrat Falls inquiry into the mismanagement and massive cost overruns at Muskrat Falls. Uh, and she will talk to us about that. And we appreciate your involvement. Roberta, take it away. Thank you, Meg. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So I just wanted to put this picture up because I think it says uh, much about what we've all been working for. It's, um, you know, it's about our children. It's about clean water for our children, healthy food for our children, and it's about the culture for our children. And that's why a lot of these uh, um, protests have happened up here. So I call this mega damage and mega destruction. I want everyone to stop financing these things. And I want people who have uh, 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 invested in these uh, different companies to divest immediately. So the next slide, please. Um, uh, just a quick, uh, just a quick um, note that uh, Grand River Keeper Labrador is a member of the Water Keeper Alliance and have been since 2005. Our email, our uh, website is there. We're on Facebook. Uh, I'm also affiliated with the Labrador Land Protectors and other uh, uh, land protecting group and they're on Facebook and of course we're a member a founding member of the North American 
North American Megadam Resistance Alliance. So just so you know who we are. Next slide. That one is actually just our mission. I'm gonna leave that there. People can go back to it later. I don't, our mission is to protect our river, period. Next slide, Meg already had a map up on her presentation. And um, this map just has a little dot right up in the, in the, the top there where you, can, um, where you can actually see where the end of uh, Labrador's river uh, is. And it's like a thousand miles from Quebec. So just to give you an idea where we are, next slide, Meg. This one is also a picture of uh, Muskrat Falls before the destruction. I just couldn't bring it, to, uh, bring it, bring myself to put a picture of the destruction. But you can go on the Nalcor website and see plenty of nice pictures that they put up about their destruction. So, what are our major river issues? Next, next slide. So, of course, hydropower. We've got two: uh, one complete, one almost complete, and another one about to be. Um, we hope not, but probably um, uh, Gull Island, and that's our big uh, push right now is to stop Gull Island from being uh, from being developed. And um, most of our power, about ninety percent of it, is exported. Um, nearly five thousand megawatts goes to Hydro Quebec until twenty forty one. One hundred and seventy megawatts of Muskrat Falls will go to Emira in Nova Scotia, which will sell their power uh, most likely to the U.S. Uh, one of the two couple of major issues that we have uh, environmentally is the methylmercury contamination. Um, that, that's contaminating the food web for a small uh, Aboriginal community downstream called Rigolette. And um, the Harvard study that was um, was um, instigated by the Nunatsiava government has clearly stated that the uh, methylmercury in the fish and seals that these people have to provide their family with food from will increase in some cases to three and four hundred percent. We have a quick clay issue. Um, the, um, one of the dams at Muskrat Falls is built on a, a spit of land that, that has very um, uh, scary layers of, of quick clay that with, with extra water or extra weight or extra uh, movement could uh, could fail and the communities downstream my community and the community of Mud Lake 36 kilometers downstream would have just about uh, 45 minutes to get out of the way of that onslaught of water and there's no evacuation plan yet for um, for um, Mud Lake um, there have been cost overruns and I know you know uh, People have already talked about the cost overruns. We started out uh, when it was approved at 6.2 billion. It's now up to 12.7 billion. And um, actually the, the, the cost of this has effectively rendered the province of Newfoundland and Labrador insolvent. Last month they had to go to the federal government and beg to have the federal government buy their bonds in order to keep the doors open. One of the big issues too is the federal loan guarantee. And I wanna get into that because I think sometimes the, the provincial government gets kicked in the rear a, a little too much, and this is all across this country, but the federal government is complicit. So I wanted you to know that and know why. So most Canadian utilities are crown corporations. I'm sorry, Meg, I, uh, if you could go to the next slide. Okay, so crown corporations, Meg explained, that they're uh, state owned and all of the benefits and the costs are borne by all the ratepayers and taxpayers of that particular province. Next slide, please, Meg. So the federal loan guarantee, um, there are links at the, at the bottom of my presentation. Uh, the last slide will give you the links to all of these different um, um, sites that you can go and look at all the, the various information. But basically the loan guarantee, um, Newfoundland had such a low credit rating that having the loan guarantee meant about a billion dollars over time in savings on interest. But to get that loan guarantee, the federal government forced the province of Newfoundland to enact legislation that ensured that the ratepayers would pay the final bill no matter how much it came to. And as I just said, it's gone from 6.2 billion 
to 12.7 billion, and I don't think we have seen the end of it yet. So they demanded a power purchase agreement. I've uh, put a link on that last slide where you can go into the power purchase agreement and read things for yourself that will make your hair stand on end. Uh, so the resulting legislation, Bill 60 and 61 in Newfoundland, made Nalpur a monopoly for all energy production in the province. You cannot put a windmill up on your land and sell any excess back to the province, back to the grid. Nalcor is a monopoly. You can put up a windmill, but you keep it all yourself. You do not get to, uh, to get some help from the federal government or the provincial government for actually uh, uh, saving um, uh, that kind of uh, energy. Um, so also uh, this uh, Bill 60 and 61 exempted the, the Nalcor from access to information. We can't find out what's going on with this, with this uh, our own um, Crown Corporation. Next slide, please. Uh, so the lower project was approved with 6.2 billion and it's gone now to 12.7 billion. I said that a while ago. And because of all of this and because of all of the environmental issues, there was a public inquiry demanded by us and LLP, the, the Labrador Land Protectors. We sent a thousand signature um, petition into the government and that's a thousand signatures from a community of 7800 people so you know the concerns of the people about this project were well documented and of course many other citizens in newfoundland as well uh, uh, sent in their their uh, demands for a public inquiry that inquiry has been completed the report of the commission is at link number four on that last slide you can have a read it will also make your hair stand up on end. Uh, Grand River Keeper Labrador and the Labrador Land Protectors um, were interveners in this process and we had, a, we had our say and had as much input as we could possibly have in, uh, with, with just a few people uh, trying to do that. So next slide, please. So what did the inquiry um, final report find? What were their findings? They called it, first of all, Muskrat Falls, a misguided project. And that basically says it all. So they said that Nalcor did not seriously consider any other option. Exclusions, Judge Leblanc said, were unreasonable. They ignored uh, demand side management, which was doubly flawed. The forecasts were guesswork. They were 50 years into the future. The judge said they were not robust. The labor productivity aggressive and based on inappropriate comparators. The contingency was unreasonably low. Many risks were not even costed. They exhibited both optimism bias and political bias, deliberately exaggerated the benefits and understated costs, is what Dr. Uh, sorry, um, Judge LeBlanc had to say. The CEO of NALCOR failed to communicate the full cost of the project to the government. Judge Levon states, NALCOR did not advise GNL of the overruns prior to financial close, close, which was an egregious failure on its part. So basically what they did all that for was to make sure that the Muskrat Falls project came in under the one scenario that they asked the Public Utilities Board to look at, which was the isolated island option. So in order to get their project as the cheapest way to provide power for the island of Newfoundland, they hid and, and, and edited reports. They consistently edited reports from the independent experts, and they were never justified in withholding information on the, on the basis of commercial sensitivity. Uh, next slide, please. So for the government's part in this, they failed in its duty. This is Dr. Uh, uh, Judge LeBlanc's words. They failed in its duty to ensure that the best interests of residents were safeguarded. And there's a link to that uh, number four on page 45. They also failed to ensure NALCOR acted fairly with indigenous peoples on page 39. They failed to ensure that environmental commitments are being monitored tracked and addressed, also on page 39. They failed to provide reasonable oversight of the project on page 43. Some government officials labeled NALCOR as a fiefdom 
and a runaway train. The project management team of Nalpur concealed information that would undermine the business case on page 50. The business case being this is the cheapest way to provide power for the island of Newfoundland versus the isolated island option. They also micromanaged the entire project to conceal information. And that's all in that document that you'll find at uh, link number four. Next slide, please. So um, just, just to see where other uh, organizations and groups be, were, were thinking this was all uh, uh, coming out at, I, I went to a site called the Frontier Cent Center for Public Policy. It's in uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba. So um, they don't, it's, it's link number seven if you want to go look at it. It paints a very bleak picture for the project. It is entirely possible that, that the province will indeed be insolvent. And in fact, as I said a little while ago, it is insolvent. Um, they just ne needed to, the federal government to buy the bonds in order to pay for this past month's uh, bills. The Gull Island project, the Frontier Center says, which is not yet started, could be sold off to pay for Muskrat Falls. And that's at uh, uh, link number nine. In case of a default, the federal government can confiscate all the assets and contracts of Muskrat Falls and the transmission line. That's in uh, uh, link number one, which is the federal loan guarantee uh, document, and it's at section 4.6 under security. Now core could be sold, the Frontier Center said, um, per province is still responsible for the four billion debt which they put up as equity in the beginning. Um, and what isn't paid down of the remaining 8.7 billion plus interest, and actually uh, over 50 years that interest is, and, and, and the uh, principal comes to $74 billion. And this is, a, this is a, an island, a province, with a 550,000 people. Not millions, a half a million. But the Energy Corporation Act, which was um, brought in by the Newfoundland government before this project started, and they added a little caveat to that act that said they were not responsible for now poor debt. However, according to that security section of the uh, federal loan guarantee, they are indeed responsible for the debt. Next, um, next slide, please. So key ask, site C, the issues are almost identical. You know, you, you look at site C, it's um, uh, 10, gone up to 10.7 at this point. Um, you look at Kezak and it's at 10.4. I, I have those figures here, I'm, I'm just going by memory. But so why, I keep asking myself, why do governments and politicians keep screwing up these major infrastructure projects? And what can we do about it? Is it political and optimism bias? Or is it just plain greed? So um, a Dr. Brent, sorry, Bent, his name is not Brent, it's Bent. And his last name is Fluberg, and I have no idea how to say it. So I'm going to start calling him Dr. Bent from now on. He states in his paper, which is at link number seven, and his presentation to the Commission of Inquiry, which is at number four, well-tested methods exist for debiasing projects based on sound theory. Some of these methods have recently been made mandatory in project management in the UK and Denmark and in many other countries. My question is, why hasn't it been made mandatory in every country, especially Western countries? So I guess, you know, why we have to keep doing this? We have to educate ourselves and others about these methods that Dr. Bent talks about and start promoting their use in one way we is one way we can curb these political and optimism biases. But as for start stopping these cover-ups and the lies and the deceit, I think our only hope seems to be to dig deep, to keep talking, to keep advocating, and to keep exposing. And that's what we are all about, this whole entire group, NAMRA, and the 30 groups that belong to NAMRA, and Grand River Keeper, and the Labrador Land Protectors. We have to keep exposing these people. Thank you so much for your time. 
and there are the links and if anyone w needs um, copies of these uh, slides and the links I'm more than happy for uh, NAMRA to provide them. Thank you so much, Roberta. That was incredible. I know how complicated that inquiry was, and I think it went on for something like 18 months, and the report was 10 volumes or something. And thank you for going through that and breaking down those points for us. That was really helpful. Um, so our next speaker is Owen Finn. I'm going to let him introduce himself. I'm not sure if we're going to slide share. Are we slide sharing? Or I'm clicking. My clicking through anyway Describe my screen a little bit okay great i'll stop share great so um owen comes to us from the west coast and i'll let him um introduce himself again and thank you so much for being here uh screen sharing doesn't appear to be Nope, I've got it. Julian, maybe you could fire it up from the Google Doc, please. Yep, definitely. <laughs> Meg, do you want to just, I don't think it's working for Owen, so do you want to just fire it back off on your screen share and then we'll just go through sure. the screen with you, Roberta? Awesome. Can you see it? Uh, I think you need to just hit the screen share button again. Oops. Okay, I lost my Zoom meeting. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, I'll fire it up on my um, side. Oh, yeah, why don't you do Yeah, okay, please and, do. Yeah. And then I'll just cue you to advance the slides. Um, great. Just one sec. To every human to really fill things up needs technology. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, and let me just make it full screen. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, now I'm back. Okay. Okay, um, I'm gonna introduce myself. Um, I am a retired, uh, retired as a full partner in the accounting consulting firm of KPMG, which is one of the big accounting firms in the world. Uh, happens to have been, until fairly recently, the auditor for BC Hydro, the progenitor of Site C, uh, the dam in Northeast BC. Um, I, I got interested in this subject of dams, sort of from a sideways perspective, because I started looking at the proposed uh, build out of an LNG industry in British Columbia, uh, which was going to be allegedly powered by uh, the grid electricity, um, particularly um, the Site C project. So. Um, and got fairly interested in the uh, in the inquiry that was launched by the BC Utilities Commission into Site C and whether it was needed or not. Um, eventually, the recommendations of the Utilities Commissions were overruled by the incoming government, uh, who decided to proceed to build this ten point seven billion dollar project. And there we sit, uh, several years into the project. Um, maybe next slide. Uh, that's what the Peace River looked like before they started digging it up uh, to build Site C. It's a um, rather beautiful part of the world. Uh, that's the valley bottom, and it's on the uh, Peace River, uh, and it's called Site C because it's the third dam in Site C, in the uh, a chain of, of dams along the, the uh, Peace River. Next slide. 
It's about uh, 1,200 kilometers, and for all you Imperial fans, 750 miles uh, north of Vancouver, uh, northeast, uh, pretty well close to the Alberta border. Uh, BC is a rather large province. Uh, you, the, the, it has some logistics problems, of course, being that far north uh, in that, uh, first of all, the transmission lines have to run that far down to the major user, which is the city of Vancouver and populated areas of the Fraser Valley. Uh, next slide. Uh, it's very controversial being built for BC Hydro, a publicly owned Crown Corporation, um, and it's owned by the provincial government. Uh, everybody of the ratepayers and, and those who are not ratepayers are, are all shareholders in this. It's expected to be in service in 2024, uh, four years from now. A big event uh, this year is supposed to be the diversion of the river uh, to allow building of the coffer dam, the outline of the, of the dam. Uh, it's supposed to happen in September, which is low flow uh, for the river at that time of year. Um, there are various rumors that it might not make that. Um, 5,100 gigawatt hours or 5.1 terawatt hours uh, cost 10.7 billion and not to mention 6,500 6, hectares of pretty good farmland uh, drowned in the course of, of filling the reservoir. 25 permanent jobs, so it's not exactly a big job producer uh, on site, um, some in head office. Um, and there's an unproven need for, for power, possibly uh, by building a grid tie line to Alberta, who would promptly use it to extract oil. So not good. Um, estimated to be about $120 a megawatt hour to break even, but um, uh, next slide. BC's industrial power uh, demand is actually dropping. It's not popular with area landowners, some of whom are First Nations, and who objected very strongly to uh, having their traditional hunting territory, flood, territory flooded. Okay, um, next slide. Um, not to mention the fact that this is a very large um, area, uh, which has been peppered by wells and drill holes for a natural gas industry. Um, and the, what you're looking at is the occurrence of large earthquakes. Uh, the ones with the bullseyes are, are on the Richter scale four or more. Um, the black ones, um, or the, the, I guess, puce colored ones are, are three to four. Anyhow, not very good in an area where you're planning to build a very large dam with a very large reservoir mm -hmm. is to have fracking holes inducing earthquakes. Um, and it's a great problem, and particularly when the geology of the area is shale, which is not the most solid structure to build anything on, let alone a large me mega dam. Next. Uh, basic uh, logistics here and uh, 73, BC Hydro, a publicly owned utility, uh, has a capacity of right about 73 terawatt hours. Uh, Site C would add about five terawatt hours to that, about 7% of its total thing. The, the um, customer base is about 2 million customers, of which 1.8 million are residential users. That's the sectoral demand. Um, and uh, I'm not showing here is that it's as you can see, the slices of the pie between residential, uh, the blue, um, commercial and light industrial, the green, and the um, industrial users, the red, uh, are pretty similar. Um, the rates are not. Uh, the, uh, there's only 190 industrial users in the whole province uh, versus 1.8 million residential users. But you would imagine that that the 190 or so industrial users actually commanded the entire policy attention of BC Hydro. Mm. Anyhow, um, next. Uh, BC Hydro, Hydro has already got a power surplus, a uh, pretty significant one, and uh, Site C will merely add to that. Uh, what the hydro utility argues is that we need it for peak demand and we always try to build for peak demand. And of course, it's a member of the Northwest Electricity Association and it has committed to keep a certain amount of reservoir and standby power handy. Next slide. 
Um, there is additional possible supply. Mm -hmm. uh, this is showing a, a, a dam at Revelstoke, um, um, showing that there's a sixth turbine. Uh, there's another dam, part of the, the Columbia River Treaty called Keenly site, which is a dam and a spillway, but no generating capability. Uh, BC has the Columbia River Treaty. If you're not familiar with it, it is, is a series of dams built in the United States just south of the border in BC in, in um, uh, Washington, Montana. And uh, that, that was, deal was done a long time ago uh, to prevent flooding in the lower Columbia and to uh, allow BC, British Columbia, to take about 4,300 gigawatt hours or 80% of the capacity of Site C to take it and use it as part of the deal allowing flooding of parts of BC uh, to build these dams just south of the border. So we have that, but we've never actually used it. Next slide. Um, IPP projects, uh, I don't know if you have them in Newfoundland, um, but they're independent power projects, they're otherwise known as run of river, have constituted an increasing and expensive and seasonal power source for our hydro utility. And uh, they're paying a medium price in 2018 of about $92 um, dollars a megawatt hour for sourcing uh, this power. Um, about a third of BC Hydro's five billion uh, revenue for the year uh, is sourced from IPPs. Uh, it's caused major environmental destruction in the streams and, and small rivers around the province. Um, and uh, if you look at the margin, um, the average, I think in 2018, sale price of electricity per, per megawatt hour was about $96. So a $4 margin between what you buy it for and what you sell it for is not enough to feed to keep BC Hydro profitable, which it is not. Next. Um, now, the big kicker, of course, is, is when Site C was proposed, everybody said, well, do we actually need it? And the answer was, well, let's look at the demand. BC Hydro predicted that demand would increase by 2% a year from here to 2050, um, basically a 60% increase. But if you look at the last uh, 19 years, 2001 to 2019, it's been flatter than, than the prairies, um, the demand. Um, even though BC's population increased by 30% in that interval. Um, so flat demand um, and everybody asked, why are you trying to build a, a Site C? So next uh, slide. Um, especially when you have a very financially distressed utility to begin with, where it's debt to equity ratio, it's a pretty common financial measure of measuring the financial health of an organization, is the highest of any utility I can find anywhere in North America by a country mile. Uh, four and a half to one. Um, if we ran a debt to equity ratio like that, where for every dollar I owned, I owed $4.50. The bank manager would foreclose on the spot. And um, that's the case with BC Hydro. But what it uses for financing uh, is the credit rating of the province, it being a crown corporation that's owned by the province. Uh, every lender knows that ultimately the backer is the province of British Columbia. And they, that allows them great freedom uh, to run these kind of deficits. Um, the, the current arrangement is that, that BC Hydro is borrowing money to pay a dividend to its government owner and share, only shareholder, um, which is, of course, eating into equity. Next. Um, so that the arguments given uh, in the Utilities Commission review was that we would, of course, have continued the historical growth, which is, I've shown you is, is almost zero, uh, and the electrification of the economy. And that's a fair objective, given how we do have to electrify our economy to get away from carbon. Uh, electrifying gas treatment plants from this fracking um, and proposed LNG industry, and then uh, the LNG industry, which possibly maybe uh, would fire up, um, particularly the three large uh, LNG export facilities, LNG Canada up in Kitimat, wood fiber in down near Vancouver, and also Fortis also near Vancouver. The biggest by far is the LNG Canada, which Shell is the major shareholder. 
Next. Um, but BC over the last uh, 19 years has, has basically deindustrialized its, its, uh, its economy. Uh, if you look on the right where the arrows are, you can see that the average industrial user uh, used to consume about 118 um, megawatt hours per annum, 118,000, sorry, uh, megawatt hours. Um, and uh, that has reduced over the 19 years by about 40%. Uh, much in line with what earlier speakers said is that the overall industrial demand is dropping as people find more efficient uh, ways of generating and using energy. Uh, whereas the residential and commercial haven't really budged at all. Next slide. So that's not a good argument. Uh, yes, switching to electric vehicles, if the BC's entire uh, small or passenger vehicle fleet is about 3 million, uh, if you switched, as BC Hydro estimates, about 10% of that, uh, you would use up about 26% of the Columbia River Treaty entitlement. Um, uh, and of course, less than that uh, of um, the slightly larger Site C. Uh, even if you were to go up to 30% of the, of the fleet, um, about 900,000 electric vehicles, and we have nowhere near that currently in BC, um, you would still want to use three quarters of the allotment of the Columbia River Treaty power, um, which uh, is way cheaper than uh, anything that's going to come out of Site C. Next. Um, so the, the savior then in, in the end result was going to be these LNG plants, which suck up huge amounts of energy in order to, to take natural gas or methane and boil it down her. The opposite of boiling, freeze it down to minus 160 degrees to put it in a tanker and ship it to Asia. And the map shows where they all are. Most of them have either gone, um, have been withdrawn or have gone dormant. And there's only three left, as I mentioned, uh, which the big ones up in Kitimat, um, about 1,100 kilometers from where the power from Site C is to be generated. So pretty huge line loss by the time you get it there and requiring more transmission lines um, traipsing across the province and of course pipelines to get the gas to the coast. Um, so, but the next slide, problem with all that plan, um, as, as indicated by the number of people who have withdrawn, uh, is that the current LNG price in Asia has plummeted below uh, $3 million per BTU, whereas the break even is around $9 per million BTU. So uh, make for nine, uh, sell for three is not the smartest business plan I've ever seen. So next, it basically makes it non-profitable. Next, uh, an LNG fuel BC economy, this is, uh, Somebody's cartoon of the past premier who started all this um, uh, said that, that LNG was going to lift the province out of debt, uh, was going to generate 100,000 jobs, and that generate um, a heritage fund of $100 billion, none of which, of course, has happened or is likely to happen because the demand for electricity from these LNG plants, uh, LNG Canada, the biggest one, has said, we're going to power the cheapest way we know how, which is from our own gas turbines, we will just cannibalize uh, part of our gas supply, about 10%, and of course, pump uh, upwards of 8 million tons of GHGs in the air every year. In a province committed to achieving zero carbon by 2050. Next. Uh, next. Uh, oh, so the third of uh, the third or fourth, I forget which, uh, alternative is, is, okay, why don't we sell this power into the United States? Um, uh, this is not showing very well here in my thing, but um, so BC Hydro predicted that, that they would soon be selling it for $60 a megawatt hour into the Northwest grid, which the hub is called the Mid-Columbian hub or Mid-Sea. And um, the problem is that, is that as, the utilities south of the border learn about solar and wind and alternative, much cheaper ways of generating electricity. Um, the market at Mid Sea Hub has diminished to about $22 per megawatt hour. So, about a sixth of what Site C is going to cost to generate that same megawatt hour. So, 
again, make for 120, sell for 22 bucks um, isn't the most brilliant business plan ever. And it looks like it's a pretty consistent trend. Uh, power is getting cheaper as utilities learn how to generate it from cheaper sources than building large dams. And um, there goes the demand that might exist. Kiosk has the same problem and Muskrat Falls similarly. Next. Um, I did a break even analysis to prove that yes, it would be. And uh, it would be about 120 bucks for a break even at site C, including the capital cost now up to 10.7 billion and counting. Uh, the operations and maintenance cost at about one and a half percent a year. Interest cost at 4% and I use that discount factor as, as a discount factor, which is over generous and figure that at 128 bucks charged to the ultimate consumers, you could probably break even with site C. Uh, if you were to uh, give it to uh, LNG industry at an industrial rate, uh, you'd be looking at a $17 billion loss or since a dollar revenue in the future is not the same as a dollar expenditure now, about a net present value of about 14 billion, negative. And ditto for selling it south of the border, you're looking at about a $27 billion loss or in that present value term, 17 billion. So no savior. This is utterly uneconomic and everybody knew it, knows it. But when you have a publicly owned utility, who in the words, in my words, um, all they have is a hammer. So everything looks like a nail. They love building large projects. Nobody, no politician loves going to cut a ribbon on a solar panel, but boy, do they love opening a brand new dam, no matter how profligate it is. Next. Um, Obviously, earlier speakers have talked about wind and geothermal. Uh, next slide, being competitive and increasing, and we have already achieved grid parity with with uh, gra gas and hydro, um, uh, with solar, and uh, we're going to continue that with wind and, and solar. Um, everybody's predicting that, that that's going to turn around. Our Blessed utility, BC Hydro, has about a 0.07% um, allowance, currently penetration of, of uh, solar power in its grid, and not in any hurry to increase that uh, because they're essentially a public utility, uh, which has a monopoly, near monopoly position on power in BC. Uh, they've actually resisted uh, anybody who wants to generate one kilowatt hour more power than they actually consume, much like Roberta has explained, and uh, are not at all interested in wind. Next. Um, so the, as we all know, the only possible sustainable energy future is renewable energy. And I'd like to quote from the Saudi oil minister that said the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Um, the oil age will end long before the world runs out of oil. Um, I would point out that next door in Alberta, uh, there are, and Saskatchewan combined, there are 10 coal-fired generating plants. And, and they are thought that BC would export site C's electricity to them and replace their, their um, coal-fired plants. It didn't seem to occur to anybody. Um, last but not least, uh, we know that that's where we're going and we should hurry to get there and stop building mega dams. Um, Wayne Gretzky, a skate to where the park is going to be, not where it has been, was his explanation as to why he was such a good hockey player. Uh, last slide. Thanks. Um, there's no known demand for site C's power at profitable prices. Uh, that's similar to Kiosk and, and Muskrat. And it is irresponsible to con continue to build it. I estimated and uh, I did an analysis that said you could spend two thirds of the proposed $10 billion, $10.7 billion cost, and it would still be a good deal to stop it. Um, the problem is that most politicians do not understand or like the concept of sunk cost and how it should be discounted in any analysis. But um, anyhow, BC Hydro is in financial trouble either way, whether it builds it or doesn't. Um, it has a really interesting accounting system, uh, which I can speak to a little bit because KPMG used to be the auditors. 
I wasn't, but um, uh, it, it bears no resemblance to any accounting system known to man. And it involves bringing forward future revenues and deferring current expenditures in order to try to balance the bucks to be able to provide government a dividend when they're actually making no profit at all. Um, that accounting must stop because it's totally distorting uh, the economics of, of these dams and, and making it such that no, no ordinary human being can understand what on earth they're producing by way of financials. Uh, I've suggested that their next uh, annual general report um, should start once upon a time. Um, BC Hydro needs to diversify its energy portfolio, adding renewables and a significant geothermal amount. An electrified BC LNG industry just is not going to happen to absorb all that extra power. Um, so we should stop producing uh, unneeded power for it. And then we have a utilities commission who has been constrained by legislation uh, produced by the politicians uh, from exercising its due diligence in oversight of stopping this very silly, very expensive and uh, ultimately ridiculous project. And other than that, I have no strong feelings on that subject. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much, Owen. That was really incredible. So much work and so much insight. Um, any questions? We thought perhaps we would just move on and hold the questions to the end, if that's okay. Um, so yes, I lots to discuss there. So um, let's move on to our next speakers then. And they are, I think, Julian, you've got the slides up. Um, our next speakers are Rita and Tommy Manias from Pimichikamak Okamawin, which is otherwise known as Cross Lake uh, Territory around Manitoba. And Rita is a community advisor at Maniskaton, the Alliance of Hydro Impacted Communities, and together with um, her husband Tommy, has been involved in raising awareness about. Manitoba Hydro for 20 or 30 years. And I, in addition to um, them being on the front lines and having seen the changes on their land from when they were children and the water was pristine to uh, the situation on the ground now, Tommy and Rita also have experience organizing their communities and working to try to figure out ways to hit big hydro in their territory, which is Manitoba Hydro, in the pocketbook. So I find their stories very inspiring, and we wanted to ask them to speak a little bit about the Hydro Payment Rebellion of Cross Lake, and also about their occupation of the GenPeg Generating Station, which essentially, well, did shut down Manitoba Hydro's um, operations depriving them of revenue. So they are um, located where this new mega dam is being built, um, Kiosk, which is far to the north in Gillum, uh, Manitoba. And there's the new Bipole 3 transmission corridor going from there down to Winnipeg and onto the U.S. via another transmission corridor to Minneapolis, St. Paul. So I think we have Rita and Tommy on the line. And um, I don't know if you're on video chat or just on phone, Rita and Tommy, are you unmuted? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, hi, Rita. Hi, I'm uh, a bit... Um, unhappy about the situation and um, the situation that we're in in uh, Pimichan territory. I grew here and um, lived on pursuits on what my art my day was and um, all of those things are uh, Disappearing some to the 
some to extin extinction is this region, which was a heart, uh, it had heart medicinal values. And um, when uh, coming to speaking on on hydro developments, I'm more of uh, in I, I am more into the human effects of uh, these developments and uh, meaning uh, spiritually, physically, mentally, and emotionally um, in tune with what I do. We have done a few. Um, a few, I don't like to call them protests, like resisting and telling the true story of what is going with our people. And I live next door, so close to Genpeik Dam. But within the river system, there is the Kias Dam that is uh, going on right now. And we have a lot of uh, treaty uh, violations done by the federal government, provincial government, and the corporations. Now, there are some treaty violations and hydro rebellion is um, one of the things that we are really uh, paying attention to because these hydro dams that are around Manitoba and the Genpeg Dam, a few kilometers from here, are affecting our lives drastically. And um, we uh, pay the price of everything. We pay a lot, uh, uh, and so much to hydro bills. Like ranging from in the summertime maybe two fifty and up probably up to a thousand and in the winter time is the uh, totally um, outrageous. So when we um, talk about losing economy, losing our lifestyle, it has a, an extremely extremely a hurting situation. Our people cannot even go out to um, doing their traditional pursuits without any danger because the navigation is really destructive, dis destructive and disrupted by the hydro dam, uh, the, by the hydro dam at Genpeg with uh, Fluctuate, there's fluctuations of water all the uh, all through the year. And when we went to Gen Peak on uh, September 27, 2014, it was um, Tommy and I who went there to uh, get attention to the destructive. Uh, the, the, the destruction of our environment and we wanted to let people know what is really going on in our lives from maybe 60 years back to now because before the Jianpei Dam there was the Kelsey and we're at the Kelsey Dam and we're in between the two Kelsey and Jane Now there are constructions on a kiosk, on a kiosk dam and the Pasquale, which was completed already. And uh, when we talk about the cost of um, hydro, hydro uh, the cost of uh, our lives, we pay the price, like I said. And Pasquale, I mean, uh, kiosk dam, or is uh, already up to seven point eight million dollar costs of uh, building um, and, and uh, the control the budget was six point five million dollars and it's still going on. 
And um, like I said, we are more concerned about the about our people and how it destroys our lives, our livelihood, and we lose people on our river system in, in the process. So um, it's really devastating. And uh, when we when we want to uh, when we want to uh, tell the truth about the hydro the, the hydro development impacts on us, we have a, a lot of difficulty because of the provincial and the corporation policies, which we don't believe in don't want to abide by their policies because it, they're only hurting us. It's um, about these, uh, these uh, news, newspaper articles that you see here. Some of them are not true as they are written because the people who were, who were interviewed in these articles were not the people who took the initiative to go and to go to Genting. Uh, there is so much political interference on us, on, on the land protectors. And then when it comes to uh, an apology from, uh, from this work, this uh, premier, uh, we don't take apologies seriously because as soon as they have done their apologies they go right back to the to their policy the provincial policy the uh, corporate policy the federal policy so we are not very uh, we don't really trust these governments like um, money doesn't pay us money doesn't pay, pay back the lives of our people so that's why we uh totally cannot trust manitoba hydro we gave them the eviction notice and then uh, after that an apology and then after that again back to where we were ignored don't want to be heard about and the sad part of what is going on is that some of our own people do abide by the policies that these governments and the corporation bring upon us so we resist that and we will continue to resist resist those policies because the lives of our people are more important than any, as they said once, unsurmountable, unsurmountable. We owe the Michigan an unsurmountable amount of dollars. So, yes, they do, but then they don't do anything about it to uh, help us. Uh, get out of this uh, impoverishment that they brought onto our lives when they uh, build the hydro dam. There are agreements, yeah, but agreements, they can break too. They break. We want to push, but then we're always, uh, we're almost always stuck, like right now, because it's politically interfered. Our our land protection and water protection and people protection are politically interfered and that's the sad of uh, everything that's going on in in Pimishima. the land and water protectors protecting the rights of people we do not we don't want to stand by and just watch that our treaty rights are violated and about consultations, I'm gonna uh, come to an end on my presentation here and uh, give it to Tommy about, uh, you know,
the consultation process and so forth. So I hope you understand what I'm saying that I'm more into the human needs of people rather than the political the political I don't know how to say it but I'm not a political person I don't believe policy I don't believe in policy and the uh, policies of destroying the environments but I'd rather be more in tune with human needs and how our people, how our human needs have been violated rather to a total impoverished coming out of these hydro developments. And what I need is our economic base on traditional pursuits, fishing, hunting, trapping, and uh, gathering of medicines how have been violated and our medicines have been destroyed and will continue to be destroyed but we do the best of uh, using every every traditional uh, practices our people do their traditional practices our people still do the medicine gathering and um, that's uh, something that we will have to continue on doing but we have to resist these hydro developments because they need to be resisted. They, they, we, we need the environment. Around here, maybe we'll, well, not maybe, we will need solar energy to stop this uh, environmental destruction around our area. I would like uh, windmill, windmills too, but then we're in an area that uh, windmill, wind doesn't produce that much, it doesn't, it, we're a forested area, but solar energy will help. And I have a um, really good and thank you very much for your presentations, because there are a lot, a lot more to think about than just to continue destroying the environment for all people, not only for us in primitive but for all people in, um, in the world. So I'm gonna sign off now and I'll give it to Tommy about uh, the consultation process of uh, how, uh, how these governments say they consult the people. In reality, Tommy will tell you what it is all about, how it's done. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you, Rita. I uh, guess basically, uh, people over there, well, um, it's consultation, um, seeking consent from the indigenous people is basically uh, uh, a drawing board uh, by Canada and also by the provincial government and also by Manitoba Hydro. Yeah, and on the sense about an agreement we that they call Northern Flood Agreement, basically there is a consultation article on the Northern Flood Agreement. Basically, it says a one, one, um, one of five meeting full consultation uh, before they build dams. Well, it's basically uh, it, it does exist on a piece of paper, but it doesn't exist in actual doing a one of five meeting consultation out of that Northern Flood Agreement. They basically go build a dams first, and they got about two, about quarter million, um, hundred million dollars already up. So they just turn around and say, "Well, we can't stop this project now, now, but we we have to go on. We spend a lot of money already. That's part of the bottom five minimum consultation that they trigger after they build these dams or blow up the whole landscape." Uh, the second one is called the uh, 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 consultation under the um, uh, Section 35 one of the Constitution of Canada. It's basically uh, the same process occurs, the same thing as with the uh, Manitoba Hydro and the Where Basically, it's just a basic, a decorated box where they do check marks on each of the boxes that they've done this. But they do not seek the consent. They just simply say, well, we've done our, our consultation and um, 
uh, we met with the leadership of the uh, each of the First Nation, which is basically Japan. And the people in the, in the on these reserves don't get a chance to say, well, we want to vote if we agree to this stuff. But uh, basically, that's completely out of the, uh, out of uh, somewhere in another planet playing in, playing in a left field. So consultation and seeking consent is not a very major factor for the Canada and for the provinces, and including our Manitoba Hydro. So we basically, uh, myself and uh, my wife, Rita, said, well, this is all bullshit. So we need to do something, start, we need to do something. So we really came up with the idea to go have some tea at the Manitoba uh, Hydro um, um, area here facility by Kempik. So we sat down, put up a and have tea. And we got approached by one of the hydro residents of the major Kentic saying, what are you guys doing here? So my answer was this, we're having tea here to our uh, homeland or to be here without our consent. So you're in the way. And then the, the dam sitting here, it used to be a lot of fish. Uh, people come here to fish and come here to camp and enjoy the scenery, enjoy the nature, enjoy the world that we lived in before. And here we are, as I'm sitting there, there's no water flow that there it used to. So we're here so we're in memories of that. Manitoba Hydro couldn't say anything about having to say this is Manitoba Hydro property. And I said, it's not. It's a uh, permitted my territory. And you were, you were here fully our people in the land. So if consultation is all BS, uh, it's not any any uh, virtue of actually saying it's an honorable way of consulting people. It's not. The second thing you have to remember is that dams, they may, Manitoba Hydro say these dams are individually uh, constructed, but when you take a look at their policies, actually integrated system in turning into a mega dams. And along the, our rivers, right across our territory, there are, I don't know, about, about eight to nine, ten uh, dams stretching out from, uh, from Winnipeg, right up Lake Winnipeg, right up to uh, Churchill. These are being a planned dams that are going to be built in the next 40 years. Um, as Rita said, the, the destruction of the environmental uh, has been turned upside down, ecologically upside down. Uh, everything that we have had when I was young and when Rita was young back then, before the dams were actually being built here, we enjoyed a good life. So I can say that we live in both worlds, good life and the bad life which the Manitoba have created. Our treaties are not honored. Our right to exist as sovereign people is not honored. Our process of understanding uh, what Hydro is doing to our rivers and to our forests, to our shorelines, it's very, very, very uh, devastating. Understanding that every second, every minute, every hour, every day, uh, in 365 days of our lives, our lands are being drowned and eroded, and our species of animals are dying out there, either drowned or froze to death because the water goes up and then you can't get out of their lodges, they froze to death. When you take a look at that, of the subsistence of our indigenous people that live with that life, you can actually say this is an actual genocide. This is an actual cultural genocide. Okay? So, dams that Manitoba Hydro goes out into the United States in the Minnesota and St. Paul, selling their energy to Northern States Power, which is owned, which is owned by Excel Energy, saying this is green and, um, energy, which is all BS. The people in the United States, the people in the United States, in New York, whoever buys these energies that's coming out of Canada in the name of hydro and it's clean energy, have to realize that it's not, not where we live. For every transmission line that goes from the United States, that people buy that energy, that when you switch off, when you switch on your, your um, 
to turn your lights on in your house. Okay, you have to understand that that is the blood of our people that you switch on to have a very luxurious, cheap energy, and that we did not consent, and we did not properly be consulted by Canada and by the provinces or by Manitoba Hydro or Quebec Hydro. The matter of that, that we've been bullied, we've been cheated. We cannot use lawyers because the lawyers are basically lawyers who have to live within the laws of Canada, within the laws of Manitoba, and within the laws of Manitoba Hydro, and within the laws of our own, of the people where we are being administered and managed called Indian Act. Then we take our lawyer, we take our case to the court. We end up losing most of the time because the laws we have to live in Canada is just basically a benefit to those who are there with basically Canada, province of Hydro. Uh, that's that's where we got get caught because our lawyers, we I, our lawyers, and they have to live and argue within those points of argument. Um, so we decided that we're not going to hang around there with the uh, with with that kind of process. We're going to go after Manitoba Hydro in our own means, in our own way, within our own laws as indigenous people. So that's what we did in the uh, in Gentech, uh event, is reoccupy our lands and then evict these people out of there. We basically did leave. Then we forced the premiers, premier uh, Greg Sullivan to cancel his trip to China and come over here and kind of a weird apology. Which is only only lasted about a year, and it went back to the same old policy. This year, in the next few years, that we're planning uh, after this uh, Corona virus actually exits from our territory and from our world, United States and Canada, the rest of the world. Hopefully, that will happen soon. That we are now planning to go after Manitoba Hydro on two items. We have 503 that crosses our territory. That is being that power will come actually come from Kiask. And we also have another pipe pool on the other side of our territory. It's basically Smith Lines basically comes from most bottom. These two uh, dams are actually contracted dams that actually will go all the way to St. Paul, Minneapolis, and then split that up in different areas for. Uh, able to meet, uh, I think it's 150 megawatts that is concrete, but it's all split up into tiny pieces and end up the whole 650 and the other dams will all probably all be sold out in the split sections. As I know from uh, from Mr. Brennan, who was the past president back then, actually put me some of the stuff that uh, when he was forced to leave from, the, from his ivory tower. After he built um, other than that, uh, we are sitting here meaning in our in, as Kibitsika people, but not as a cross state First Nations Sudan, but trying to exercise our sovereign right to say no, no, no. We do have a right to say no, but uh, we don't agree with the the concentration of any project. Uh, I think the government needs to understand that, that we have a right to say no, uh, including that. The other people who are in the United States, people have a right to say no too. This is our right, it's a human right thing. Um, so, in the corridors back there, that I know a little bit about with those corridors, those corridors that you that are going to be that where the transmissions are going to go through. It's a very, very devastating because uh, the, migra the migrations and caribous and people, uh, and some animals do not cross these lines because they avoid these lines. So they migrate differently than they used to. Okay? So that's another thing you need to understand that. Although, and then there's also uh, emissions of mercury. Uh, that goes up in the and you can smell it sometimes when you travel on the Gentic, the, the, the smell of it, the organic smell that's coming out of these waters. 
I believe we did one time a mercury poisoning test here in, in our community uh, back then, which I was not around at that time, but I heard there was one, and I don't know what happened after that. I think they, um, they uh, terminated that because uh, Canada's cross-state ban uh, negotiate for money, and they actually settled that. That's so, so, so not happening anymore. You, you have to understand the politics, as Rita says, the politics of two, three parties here. There is cross-state ban, who is administered and managed by a federal law called Indian Act, which is basically Canada's law. Okay? And then, yeah, there's another side of us, which is domestic mouth, which does not operate within these laws, but it operate on its, its own sovereign, traditional and customary laws. It's, so there's an infighting between these three, uh, three entities, Canada's bans, which is First Nation, they call it First Nation, and our traditional government, our traditional sovereignty. Uh, it's very difficult, like Rita says, there's a political interference on both sides, including the province joins Canada and Manitoba joins Canada, including the province, to go after, including the band, to go after a traditional governance of our, of our own people. So there's a very huge, huge gap of where understanding does not exist. Uh, Canada does not want to actually really recognize a government of 2,000 years old. And even though Section 35 one says uh, they recognize Aboriginal and Treaty Rights and all that, all that stuff they write in their constitution, basically, it's not exist. It's a piece of paper written on a piece of paper uh, to make him them look good. But the most hardening fact you have to understand is enable for us to move forward. We have to get rid of the system called the band. Okay? The reason why we need to get rid of this is to get rid of this bad is this. The Indian Act has a section 88 where it says all provincial and federal, federal laws will apply. Yeah, that basically means Hydro Act, Water Power Act, and other provincial. That's where everything becomes an important piece. So anyway, I am just giving you a little bit of uh, information on that, so, but you guys can look into uh, what's going on uh, in regards to that. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tommy and Rita. We really appreciate you taking the time um, out to talk to us and so many issues um, are really important uh, to you and your community. And um, there is certainly a lot more um, to learn about it. And as I mentioned, uh, Iskatan has a great website and thank you for being involved. Um, thank you to everyone. We do have a few minutes left for question and answers. If people, well, I see that it's two minutes before two o'clock. If people are willing to stay on and would like to talk for a few minutes, we'll keep the line open. Um, I, I also have up here other ways to get involved. We do have a Google group, which you can join by emailing us. We have bi-monthly calls where we discuss our ideas. We have a newsletter, we have social media, and we really hope that this will be a chance for us to continue the conversation and bring our collective resources together to see how we can try to turn this big battleship around, um, the political inertia. And I really liked, uh, Owen's analogy that they have a hammer and a nail and they don't know what else to do besides build dams. And I think it's going to take a lot of people power and a lot of resistance here in the US to try to turn that ship around or better yet, shut it down. So any questions? Yes, can I ask mine is, is Peter still on the line or is he gone? He's gone. He had to get it off at 2.45. He okay. did indicate that we could ask him questions, so why don't we plan to do that? Okay. Is there any way that we can discuss and like at least put it out into the ethers that, that we could possibly use some of his stats from his reporting to help create some counter-advertising for the 
against the hydro stuff here, especially in Maine, we are getting constant bombardment from Avangrid and CMPs, like saying how great the, the NECEC is. And I'm so tired of it. Do you know, I, do I understand right, Julian, that you're from Maine somehow or something? Have I heard that? <laughs> do you I, agree? I have you seen them? <laughs> yeah, I have. Um, yes. and, and, and like, yeah. And, and then we are also, working. Go ahead. And, Sorry. and I'd also like to make sure that we can also put our heads together because it seems like what Peter was saying about the the whole need to to ramrod this this thing through because it's what they know what to do. If we can figure out how to help them depend on another more meaningful economy source you know something other than hydro and something you know i mean they've already sunk how much money in billions of dollars in in the ad campaign here in maine and how can we offer them an alternative to turn to so that they can see Oh, we don't need to be ramrodding or sending spending all this money. And central main power is at the very bottom of all of the customer service, and they're still having the gall to charge all kinds of money to people for mistakes that they made in their billing process. And yes. it's so, so frustrating. I, in the interest of time, it's already <laughs> yeah, two o'clock. I so much that there is so much uh, good work going on in Maine, and I can point people to um, say no to any seat.